Steels and Stranger built upon this work of naming games and the self-organization of perceptual categories. This time they focused on body posture and the coordination of lexicon for body posture. First, they began with kinesthetic training, in which the experimenter moves the robot's body into a set of desired positions. You can think about the mother often moving the baby into positions of the position of standing or moving the baby's arm when the baby is at a very, very young age. This is known as kinesthetic teaching. From this process, the robot is able to remember the sensor or motor traits of the posture and is able to replicate the posture. But there's no meaning associated necessarily with the posture, although, as you're going to find out, meaning is just sensor motor, actually. Uh, then the robot replica replicates the set of body postures at random through motor babbling. Okay? This is similar to what developmental psychologists identify as infant babbling and random infant motor activity. So they put the robot in front of a mirror. This is to help coordinate its visual uh, perceptive ability uh, with its sensor mode, with its other sensor motor feelings, and it would happen at random. Again, similar, not exactly similar, but how a baby randomly will babble and move its arms at, a, at a very early stages of life. <clears throat> okay? This motor babbling is performed in front of the mirror, and the visual features are then recorded so as to generate a, an image schema. After all of the participating robots have per performed this motor babbling in front of a, in front of a mirror, uh, they are then brought together and they put them in front of each other. <clears throat> uh, they stand face to face and participate in a naming game, similar to that which we already covered. This results in the near perfect coordination of shared vocabulary of body posture after 3,000 games. So here, these robots have their own internal uh, lexicons, words that they associate with the body postures, completely separate from all the other robots. They put the robots to facing each other, and they will then do the same game where, they will, where one robot will say something, the other robot will then make a position. The other robot will say no, or not say, but will shake its head no, or, or nod yes. And if it, said, if it goes no, it will, then it will then imitate what it believes it said. And over the course of 3,000 interactions, uh, you can see initially there is very little coordination, but very quickly, after about 3,000 to 2,000 interactions, they move to ha sharing uh, a lexicon. And there's, as you can also see here, this is the number of uh, the, the, the quantity of the lexicon, the number of words overshoots and then reaches a kind of uh, attractor state. Now, now it gets really interesting. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> After all of the participating robots have generated, uh, they have coordinated their schema, uh, they are, uh, sorry, there is an evolutionary process known as exaptation, okay, uh, which suggests that utility and origins of systems are not necessarily related. In other words, the biological traits that are structurally coupled in one utilitarian function uh, can over time be co-opted into another structurally coupled utility. I'll put this in some more simple words uh, for, uh, as an example. For example, there's evidence that shows that the feathers of birds originally developed before birds could fly. This means that feathers were not functionally, did not functionally evolve for flight. But 
So, so at this early stage, this early point in the bird's history, feathers actually regulated body temperature. Uh, but then later, they ended up proving useful for flight. <clears throat> this is a process known as exaptation. So, building off of Lemon's uh, research into uh, the human language network of posture verbs, such as sitting, standing, lying, Steeles and Sprangers demonstrated how assuming the exaptation of language strategies, the lexicon of body-based postures could be harnessed through language games to metaphorically communicate the spatial position and stance of a third object, a non-human object. Again, this coordination of metaphorical language was not determined by the researchers, but rather self-organized via the attentional interaction of the robots during language games. So what they did is they put these same robots in a room with shapes similar to what you're going to see here, and these shapes had different positions. <clears throat> they assumed that through the process of exaptation that we could then take the, the, meta, the, the shared language that they had, the shared linguistics they had already uh, self-organized for body structure or body posture, and then apply this to third level objects. And this here is the foundations for metaphor being used to describe things that are not exactly the human body. For example, a plastic bag is lying in the dirt. One town sits on a hill overlooking the valley. The other town sits in the middle of the valley. The cathedral stands in the middle of town. So I'm showing you here how how we can then take metaphor, metaphor that, we, that would self-organize itself in our interactions with other people to describe our own bodily positions, and this can then be extended onto other physical things. But not only physical things. We have the extension of language and cognition. I thought that this was funny, so I included it. Um, not many people have stayed to uh, enjoy it. Uh, that's okay. <clears throat> um, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson outlined that the cognitive mechanisms that allow us to perceive and move around also create our conceptual systems and modes of reason. Reason, even in its most abstract form, makes use of rather than transcends our animal nature. Reason is not universal in the transcendent sense. What allows it to be shared are the commonalities that exist in the way our minds are embodied. Reason is not completely conscious, but mostly unconscious. Reason is not purely literal, but largely metaphorical and imaginative. Reason is not dispassionate, but emotionally engaged. And they then go on to identify what they call primary metaphors. And these are metaphors that allow us an understanding, an, an understanding of things in the world at an abstracted level. So again, where does the symbol come from for us to understand abstract ideas such as power or hate? These come from our body, and these primary metaphors are rooted in our body. So such, uh, in our relationship with the world. Purposes are objects. Affection is warmth. Important is big. More is up. Similarity is closeness. We are seeing here again our understanding of something abstract, similarity, more, important, is connected to our physical situatedness within the world. And these primary metaphors uh, will then blend in association with various image schemas to create what are known as complex metaphors. Love is a journey. 
Accomplishments are movements. And these are just a few examples. Beliefs are possessions. Ideas are perceptions. Time is a resource. Society is a body. <clears throat> Motivation and learning dynamics. Please bear with me. I'm really excited and interested. I wish I could transfer my excitement and uh, onto you, but obviously I can't. <clears throat> we'll now turn to the, our attention to the issue of learning. According to Dehan et al., infants have a proclivity to disproportionately attend to novelty. Things that are novel to us that we do not already know seem to be intrinsically motivating to infants. We, can't ex we have yet to be able to really explain it. Exploration seems to, somehow uh, seems to be somehow intrinsically ingrained uh, in cognition and, intrinsically, and is intrinsically rewarding. I would argue that this is not only a characteristic of infants, but of all ages up to a certain point. Now, we are nowhere close to being able to understand this intrinsic characteristic, but we can gain valuable insight into the conditions for learning from neuroscience and from the attempts by researchers to replicate intrinsic motivation in artificial agents. Diane and Balin, uh, Balain, sorry, have found that dopamine cells in vertebrate in the vertebrate midbrain report errors in the prediction of reward. That is to say that dopamine cells are active in bringing expectations for reward together with the likelihood of reward. In doing so, dopamine facilitates an intrinsic cognitive orientation towards maximizing learning. In this respect, the motivation to learn is as primary a human need as food, water, and sex. Because the successful attainment of food, water, and sex ultimately depend upon learning. This completely dispels the myth that there are children who are just not motivated to learn. Odier et al., capitalized upon this recursive role of dopamine in error prediction for the construction of an open-ended artificial learning system that would self-organize a developmental process while imitating fundamental aspects of infant development. Their solutions to the issues they confronted in the process and the results of their experiments hold great lessons for educators. <clears throat> And here, this is the experiment as it's happening. Uh, this other robot is actually not important to this experiment. Okay. What they found was that to achieve an open-ended develop to achieve open-ended development of their system, an active learning system was more appropriate than a passive learning system. This means that for open-ended development. Continual development over, for over a long period of time, uh, the learning must be self-directed, not outside-directed. The only outside-directed role was the provision of a rich learning environment, and, and in this case, the provision of this uh, play toy that's often associated with for young infants. They also found that for the system to be self-directed, it had to engage in activities for the pleasure of engaging in activities, not engage in activities as a practical step in solving a problem or working towards a goal. We have to engage our world because we want to engage our world, not because there's a reason, not because there's a goal to us doing it. Odier et al. characterized this as, quote, the essence of play. 
End of quote. For those of you who are interested, there is a wealth of research currently available on the role of play in cognitive development. It seems to be essential and connected to what it means to be human, actually, uh, and other mammals as well. In order to maximize the learning process, they had to replicate the role of dopamine in the error prediction. The model ended up learning over time to predict and avoid, but not completely avoid, unlearnable situations and situations already learned. In other words, to maximize learning, the system was attracted to, in this case, affordances, these are affordances, things that it can interact with on its environment, within the environment that were not too difficult and not too easy. Odeyer et al. note how this computational necessity complements neatly Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, is that our development, our successful development, requires us interacting with the world in a way that is not too difficult and not too easy. I know a great example is this lecture. <clears throat> so, finally, their system was designed in a way that was not coordinated or functionally programmed to do anything in particular. Okay? In a simplified sense, the system merely tried to imitate the sensor motor and intrinsic motivational system of an infant. Ultimately, the sensor motor systems coordinated their behaviors into what they termed a developmental trajectory. And this is an example here of a common developmental trajectory that they found was that a period of just looking around was followed by a period of just biting, followed by a period of just bashing. Later then, this ends up coordinating with uh, its sight, with, its abil uh, with its, where its head is as well. <clears throat> Within the trajectory, there were, in, there were independent periods of sensor motor coordination. These right here represent the periods of sensor motor coordination. Is that in this case, we'll see that he, the, the robot, and I'll just say he, he was biting at an object at the same time that he was looking at the object and was thus able to then rectify the sensor motor experience of biting with biting an object. And this was not random. This, it was initially random, but actually this actually ends up coordinating because they compared this to, to a purely random system. And we end up not finding, uh, in a purely random system, these periods of coordination do not happen frequently. Almost very, very infrequently, actually. <clears throat> okay? What does this, what does this imply? They actually, uh, I'm going to call, what they call here these progress niches, I'm going to call schemas, okay? Is that this implies that schema, whether behavioral or conceptual, are not only dependent upon the physiological development and experience of the individual, which they are, but they are also inextricably tied to the external environment and our interaction with the external environment. You can probably see where this leads us. This leads us to the idea of distributed cognition. It is a socio-psychological cognitive theory based on the perspective that human cognition is embodied, but extends cognition into the realm of interactions with others and with artifacts and with the environment as a whole. For example, in your head, can you please do this mathematical, uh, uh, can you please uh, solve this mathematical equation? Perhaps it's easier if we put it in this form. Or you can use a pen and a piece of paper and I guarantee that all of you can perform this mathematical function quite easily, in fact. What this shows us is that uh, it is apparent then to us that then the pen 
and the paper actually enhance your cognitive performance of mathematics. The outcome or ability or behavior is in part a result of the artifacts and environment. Social organization and the external world in general allow opportunities for distributing cognitive burdens in efficient ways that allow for cognitive performance beyond the individual. Again, can we even conceptualize of buildings like these without mathematics and computers and everything that came before it? Again, the idea of a, uh, of a history, a lineage. <clears throat> I doubt that I would have been able to organize this presentation without, uh, in, in the manner that I did, without the presentation software. In fact, this presentation looks nothing like I originally envisioned it. The process of putting words into the word processor, finding imagery for the presentation, organizing the slides and the multitude of reorganizations and revisions that went into this cognitive endeavor were aided and at times instigated by the artifacts that I used, the computer, the internet, etc. <clears throat> Furthermore, this presentation, something that I've assembled during my time at Jeju National University, is more academic compared to the conversation textbook that I uh, produced to sell when working at a private institute. The things that we produce, the things that we, how we perform is absolutely connected to our environment. Our cognitive process is structurally coupled to the artifacts and to our environment. However, this influence goes both ways. Our cognition mutually bootstraps larger cognitive scales. Let us consider culture. Do you think that culture is real? Does Korea have a culture? Is Korea's culture different from Japanese culture? Yes, I will say that culture is real. Does culture affect your behavior? Do, who made or who makes this culture? Is culture changing? Why is it changing? Who is changing it? Again, it's the interactions of the individuals that results in the formation of the culture. The culture then feeds back onto our behaviors. And we, in fact, change culture through our behaviors. So we can see how our... Hey, guy. We can see how our interactions at the local levels actually end up having uh, very large influences. Social organization itself is a form of cognitive architecture, according to Holland. If we look, for example, at hunter-gatherer societies, there were only a few dozen distinct social roles. Okay, maybe 20 or 12 or something like that. Whereas in modern industrialized societies, we have 10 to 20,000 distinct occupations. For example, uh, this gentleman, his job is that of a concert security. His job is to provide security at a concert. That's his job. That's a distinct occupation. We see that we move towards greater complexity within our cognitive architecture as society advances. <clears throat> Bringing people together for a competitive yet friendly, charitable tournament, or bringing people under the umbrella of a temple, church, synagogue, or mosque, or bringing children together in the place of learning, or conscripting young men into military service, these are all attractor states of human cognition. Let's take a moment quickly to review. Systems are structurally coupled to their environment and other systems. Their process of growth and development mutually bootstraps the growth and development of other systems. Environment. The environment affects cognitive performance and neural branching and even brain structure. Brain function. 
Brain function is a real-time adaptive process. It is, con it is a continual process of bringing the external in line with the internal and vice versa. There are a multitude of internal systems that are continually interacting with each other and their environment to maintain stability. Sensor motor function. Sensor motor function emerges from the multitude of internal systems continually interacting with each other and the external environment to maintain metastability. <clears throat> Language. Language is inextricably tied to the body and body-to-body -body interaction. It, it self-organizes via the interaction with the environment and with others. Cognition. Cognition extends via our cultural architecture. Learning. Learning is an essential and dynamic characteristic of life. Understanding and development are ongoing transient processes that continually undergo phase shifts, but nevertheless self-organize via the intrinsic motivation to learn. So where does this leave us then? <clears throat> There is a fundamental problem with the current structure of our educational paradigm. The structure of our system is predicated on the assumption that knowledge is independent of the individual and knowledge is transferable. If it were transferable, you would understand what I'm saying <laughs> in the same way that I understand it. <clears throat> this assumption is a myth. Modern science has evolved and unified to the point where we better understand how knowledge, in association with cognition, self-organizes and coordinates through the body that is, inseparably, that is inseparably tied to the external world and other bodies, other people. Yet our educational paradigm lies in direct opposition to this modern scientific understanding. Our schools are isolated from the community. The schools are separated into cubicle root units of classrooms. We continually separate students from other students through class structure and performance testing. And we further distinguish students from other students through grading and ranking. The knowledge to be learned in the current paradigm is standardized according to arbitrary assignations of importance. The units of knowledge that teachers feed the students are devoid of meaning and context. Students are fed these units of knowledge as they move down the production line of industrial education. There are roughly 25 different types of neurons in the human body. They are all important to the properly functioning brain. That is, if there is even such a thing as a properly functioning brain. Analogously, there are 16 different personality types according to the Myers-Briggs personality uh, type indicator assessment. And according to Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence, there are, are at least eight distinct types of intelligence that people exhibit. All of these cognitive profiles are important to the cognitive network of our civilization. Yet students have told me through their essays that certain personality traits of theirs relating to their MBTI are, quote, shameful. They feel shame for the unique and distinct traits that make them who they are. I understand why they feel this way. Our education system tries to standardize the characteristics and expression of human cognition, despite this being impossible. As a result, learners feel inadequate and often even stupid. This is especially the case 
for children who have not had the privilege of growing up in a warm, nurturing, and loving home. We damage their emotional and physical well-being in our, headlong, in our headlong rush toward an illusion. Thankfully, some of them drop out and follow their own thirst for life, learning, and meaning. <clears throat> Cognition is a biological process, and as we've seen, biological processes are characterized by a balance between structure and dynamics, interdependence and independence, stability and chaos. Cognitive structures and patterns will form. We don't need to formalize them. The structures or behaviors that are not sustainable will not sustain themselves. It's impossible. When we formalize the education system, we close its openness to independent behavior. Right or wrong. Red or yellow. Living systems must maintain openness to independent behavior. Otherwise, the systems fossilize and die. Let's use the ant colony optimization outcome algorithm to help us visualize the point I'm trying to make. In this case, there is the ant colony home location and the location of source of food. Without any top-down control, the ant colony will find the optimal route between the colony's home and the food source. <clears throat> Let's imagine instead that these two points represent where society is and where society is going. Once we know the destination, we can constrain the behavior of all the individuals to most efficiently and effectively move in the right direction, right? Wrong. We we can't do that. We need the individuals who move outside of the normal routes of behavior. Without them, society will never find its next food source. In the case of the ant colony, the colony will never find its next food source, and the colony will perish. Finding this balance is not easy, but we know it will manifest itself through the quantity of interaction. This recognition changes the entire game. I'm almost finished. The current education system we have, in which individuals compete based on individual performance, inhibits interaction by incentivizing the hoarding of information by students, so as to increase the chances of them getting a high test score relative to other students. Yet we have seen that shared experience and interaction is what really results in the coordination of categories, the coordination of knowledge. In other words, this structural trait of our current educational system actually reduces cognition. We actually hurt, we actually kill cognition and kill learning given our current structure of education. If we were truly interested in maximizing learning for all participants, we should heed Larson and Freeman and Cameron's call to focus on how to motivate participation. But Damon, some students just aren't motivated, is the refrain I often hear from my students here. Hogwash. Garbage. As I've already pointed out, curiosity and motivation and the motivation to learn is an instinctive drive. It is as important to what it means to be a living being 
as eating, sleeping, or having sex. The students just aren't motivated by a system that doesn't meet their needs. Remember, the infant is attracted to objects that it's most likely to learn from. Why do you think children spend so much time playing video games? It's not because video games are easy. It's because good video games achieve a balance of choice, challenge, and advancement. And I'm not just advocating video games here. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying is that video games are doing something correct that we are not doing within our educational structure. Unfortunately, I've had many students tell me in their essays on English learning that they were interested in learning English. But they lost all interest and motivation through middle school and high school. One student wrote, quote, The only people to survive are those that are willing to endure hell. That is not the foundation for a sustainable education system. We must accept that learners are complex systems and allow students greater control in their education process. They will naturally direct themselves to what provides them the greatest opportunities for learning. I will quote Evan Thompson with one slight change. I replaced his word, systems, with learners. Quote, learners need to be seen as sources of their own activity specifying their own domains of interaction, not transducers or functions for converting input instructions into output products. In other words, the autonomous character of these learners needs to be recognized. If you think that we must compel and force learning, I offer up this presentation as evidence to the contrary. This presentation is not part of my official job responsibilities. No one required me to do this. There is no immediate extrinsic reward to it in the form of money or promotion. I did it because I want to share. I want to share with you. We all want to share. It's part of being human. Allow learners the opportunity to fail. As educators, we should make it clear that there is no shame in failure. <coughs> failure is an essential part of learning. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be discouraged. <coughs> if we punished the baby every time the baby fell down while trying to learn to walk, it wouldn't learn to walk. Our learning environment should encourage risk-taking, whereas often students are afraid and fearful to, in the case of the English language classroom, to speak English. We should feed the learner's fire to do something beyond their current ability. You can see how this changes the role of the teacher. The teacher is no longer a distributor of knowledge. They actually never were. The teacher becomes an engaged participant in the learning environment. In this learning environment, everyone participates in meaningful activities in meaningful ways. The teacher is more a facilitator who observes the moods, motivations, and well-being of the learners. The facilitator provides a rough structure, which learners fill in and expand out in their own way. Real learning and understanding are always meaningful. And meaning is always rooted in our experiential, contextual, physical relationship with the external world. The environment cannot be separated from the individual's cognition at any level. At any level. The facility... Uh, our educational paradigm should reflect this. Our educational approach to our educational environment should facilitate meaningful interaction among learners, 
within the construct of our community. If the student's learning environment is segregated and compartmentalized and decontextualized, then this is the cognitive framework we are fostering. The only possible result of students learning about boxes while sitting in boxes located inside larger boxes is a cognitive box. The organization of our learning environment and education system has far-reaching implications. As Dr. Francis Halian points out, local interactions eventually produce global coordination and synergy. We can see in the way that we build our cities is connected to the way that we construct our educational environment. The, the, re, this, the reconceptualization and transformation of education em, embraces and complements how cognitive systems function. I am talking about moving our educational paradigm closer to what it means to be a human and to be alive. In finality, embrace differences, delight in our diversity, and engage in meaningful interaction. Thank you very much for having the patience to, to survive my presentation. And I will actually answer questions if anyone has any questions that you want to ask, although I'm sure you're all really tired and exhausted, and, and I'd love to, you know, engage in a conversation with you now, or if you want to go have dinner, we can go have dinner and engage in a conversation there as well. It's probably more meaningful. <laughs> no questions? So your title? Yeah. Oh, and this talk was, You Cannot Teach. Yes. In summary, can you why why I said elaborate uh, what would follow after you cannot teach you cannot teach what or you cannot teach the the uh, the interact for example the interaction of the robots in relation to color or in relation to the the body categories that's a coordination of categories knowledge is just a coordination of categories so what they are showing is that. That, that knowledge, because the way that our neural system works, is that understanding is always rooted in experience. So the idea that we could take understanding, a coordinated category, and transfer it from one place to another place is absolutely ridiculous. And so if we understand that we cannot translate information or knowledge from one place to another place, then we understand that we that teaching, the idea of being able to teach knowledge or teach ideas, is a ridiculous idea. And so what, act, what so then you're probably wondering, well, Damon, what, what does happen in the schools that we see children learning? And I think that this is a testament to the human brain and a testament to children is that they actually end up they end up forming a relationship with their environment, with their teacher, but that, that, that relationship is mostly just meeting the expectations of the teacher. And so thus then a lot of it, it comes with uh, just memorizing words or symbols and then just repeating them or regurgitating them out uh, in a test format or in homework or to the teacher during the process of a presentation. Um, so it's, it's not real learning. And in fact, oh, and I was just going to say, in, in my discussions with our students, is, is that uh, we'll say to them, uh, for example, do you remember uh, what you, what you uh, learned while you were preparing for the test? And most students say no, that they usually forget what they studied for a test usually within 24 to 48 hours of studying for a test. Go ahead. Uh, in your talk, you are, you are, not, you are not negating uh, the value of education. I am not negating. You are, you are talking about how. 
I'm talking about. Yeah, the, 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 the current structure that we have does not, is not conducive with how cognition actually works um, for, our current, for our modern understanding of cognition. Um, the, the whole structure, it just doesn't fit very well. It's, it's, an, out, it's an outdated paradigm. So I'm thinking of this uh, picture that you presented earlier in, uh, in, in uh, someone's brain. That's yes. like classroom a setting and that's yeah. a nature setting. Yes. So uh, you are not talking about picking one uh, out of those two. It's more like how we are going to configure those two compartments uh, to... Yes. To yes. Yeah, I, in yes, I am, I am taking a very extreme position to the side of dynamics and to the side of chaos. Um, and if we go completely in my direction, that will probably also fail as well. Because your talk itself is building on the knowledge of... Yes, you know, is that we have... We have, we have knowledge is also uh, based on the education a system as well. It your, is. Your whole talk and your uh, uh, yes. conceptualization and everything. Yeah, our, our entire social, I mean, system has survived up to this point. Right. Uh, and so that reflects that it actually, that there is an element of living to it. My, yeah, my argument is that we have taken our educational paradigm so far to uh, the, the um, standardization of education that we are in fact killing learning by taking it that far uh, to, to just standardizing and structuralizing everything. So I'm arguing that we need to pull it back towards a much more individual, autonomous, dynamic approach. We can't completely go, the pendulum cannot completely go in that direction also, uh, otherwise that also will risk failure to the system as well. Uh, a, a example that I often will use is that you don't want Damon building an airplane. You don't want to fly in an airplane that Damon builds. Um, because given my personal attributes, um, I will forget <laughs> to do some things. And that's just my personal nature. And so, so yeah, but I, um, I, I'm putting forward uh, a direction where I think that we need to correct towards but of course, um, we, we, structure is important. Structure absolutely is important. But it will self-organize itself also. How, uh, 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 how can you teach uh, 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 mathematical multiplication? And, uh, you, uh, yeah. How, uh, yeah. Uh, using, using this framework. You, you, using these ideas, how could you go about teaching mathematics or leading a mathematical class? And I think in that situation is that you would have to find ways of making the mathematics immediately applicable to their life. And in a meaningful way. I'm not just, and so I'm not just talking about using um, uh, uh, stories to frame a mathematical problem. I'm saying is that what we do is we say to the kids, hey, let's raise vegetables to help feed poor people. Or let's organize um, a business to raise money for a field trip. And in the process of doing that, we are probably going to need mathematics to be successful. So we find ways of integrating mathematics holistically into our educational curriculum. And so we, we end up, what happens is again, uh, as I kind of spoke with, with complex systems, complex systems and these dissipative structures allowed for a unification of biology and chemistry and um, uh, physics, and then uh, that was dissipative systems, and then complex systems then allowed for the integration of the social sciences as well, is that what we do is we, we integrate our curriculum. Is that the math is not separated from the English, is not separated from the Korean, or separated from the history. So these things are all, because in real life they are all tied together. Okay. Uh, I think cognitive system or cognitive 
information is important in learning and Absolutely. learning situation and in learning system. But when you are eager to do something for others or when you are interested in something, you can study more. Yes. We, oh, and so are you talking about uh, that we want, uh, for example, that we want to uh, fulfill the expectations of our parents? Like meeting our parents' expectations? Is that kind of what you're talking uh, about? Or, or do you mean that, that kind of, uh, that we want to, uh, among our peers, that we want to kind of be seen as being smart or intelligent compared to our peers? To say this, Go ahead. So okay. Most parents want their children get higher degree of yeah. test. Yes. And that means they think their children can be yeah, successful, right. and most the students think they can get famous university is the successful way of living. But in learning, I think in it, it, it a learning meaning, they, when they are not interested in doing something meaningful, they cannot to learning and, and forever. Okay, so, oh, yeah, like so there, there, are, there are two parts there that I, that I will address. Is that um, the, the first part, you're, you're talking about what's called ex extrinsic motivation. Motivation that is outside of the individual. Okay, and I will agree. Um, actually, in, extrinsic motivation does play a role. I find that it does actually play a nice role is that my job is to have students learn English. A lot of students don't want to learn English. And so thus then, I try to use as much intrinsic motivation as possible and, and uh, uh, methods for motivating intrinsic motivation. And yet at the same time though, extrinsic motivation such as grades, points, uh, does play a role in helping motivate their interactions. Uh, so I just don't want to study, but to get higher degree or good points. That is the problem, I think. Well, but it would, it would be, okay, and, and so then that's then this, the second, is that one thing that we, that in, a, a lot of that is a result of the system. Remember that systems are affecting the individual agents, and the individuals are, of course, affecting the systems. And so we have established a system in which grades and testing are very important. So these end up affecting their, uh, uh, their kind of uh, uh, personal, you know, their, their, their cognitive mindset, that I want to get high grades. I want to get 100% on that test. My, my, my uh, proposal here is that we get is that we try to break that mind, we try to break that mindset. And we move towards, because the problem with that mindset is that we, in that process of that mindset, we actually hurt cognition beyond that person who gets the highest score. We actually end up hurting the growth of cognition among all of the individuals, of all the students, of all the learners. Is that some students end up is that in that system is that they end up not sharing. And when we are not sharing in that system, we end up reducing cognition. I don't know what forms cognition is going, what forms cognition will take in the future um, when we change away from this, this structured, extrinsic reward system. But I think that it will be, uh, actually, I, I'm sure that it will be more robust it will be more beautiful, it will be more meaningful. Be, and if it is more meaningful, then we know that people will be motivated to interact within that system, within that structure. Um, it just won't be um, as, as uh, formulaic, it won't be as standardized, because we can't standardize it. But I understand your, I under, I understand your point. I absolutely do. So you can study hard if you want to success, be successful. That is a self-interest. Well, again, like for example, this presentation. This presentation is going. 
I was does nothing for really for my future in, on, from an extrinsic reward basis. The reason why I did this is because I had an I uh, uh, interests that have been motivated by the relationships uh, that I've had with people, even with you, even with you, even with you, with you, with you, with you, and with you. These relationships that I've had with people have motivated my conceptual understanding. And these ideas kind of work towards each other. And I decided, it's like, I want to share this. I want to share this with people. And so, I'm, and so I think that this is an excellent example of how we can be motivated not by reward. Not by some external goal. We are motivated by a desire to share with other people. And actually, this desire to interact and learn and share from our environment is actually what it is to be human. To be a learning human within the world. And the, th the problem is that we, we start killing it at a young age. Uh, again, young children speak the language of their parents before they enter elementary school. They learn a language naturally without a structured system. As I've talked about, children are interested, are motivated to learn. And by the time they get through middle school, they hate our education system. They characterize it as hell. And it becomes a system in which who basically has the patience or who is motivated by extrinsic reward, which is very superficial, money, power, um, nice house, and who is most motivated by that, those are the people who succeed in that system. I'm talking about a system where we create a system where maybe people who have a great amount of empathy or sympathy can also thrive and succeed. Not because, because these people are maybe not as motivated by extrinsic reward. A person like me, for example. In university, my professor was often amazed that I was not very motivated by grades. I was more motivated by learning. 